Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Welcome to this discussion on community engagement for sustainable cities. I'm Audrey Prost, a professor of global health at University College London and your host for this session. And I'm joined by Paul Eakins, professor of resources and environment policy at UCL. We're having this discussion because the 11th Sustainable Development Goal calls on all of us to make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. We're here because we think that community engagement is vital to participatory, integrated, and sustainable planning for cities. What do we mean by community engagement, though? Well, I think we mean public participation in decision-making and priority setting, and especially participation of the most affected and the most marginalized. Community engagement can take place via public consultations, elections, local referendums, public hearings, neighborhood advisory groups, town hall meetings, but also protests and demonstrations. Importantly, community engagement can also be facilitated by relationships between universities, civil society, and local government. So to discuss the state of community engagement for sustainable cities today, we're joined by a fantastic panel with expertise that spans urban planning, development, economics, political ecology, and politics. And they'll be speaking from the vantage point of their work in cities in India, Cuba, and in the United Kingdom. We've asked each of our panelists to speak for about eight to 10 minutes about their work on community engagement as it relates to sustainable cities and communities. And then we'll open up the floor for discussion. We'll also be taking questions from the audience by a Slido. So I encourage you to post your questions there. So let me start by introducing our first speaker. Dunu Roy is the director of the Hazard Center in Delhi in India. The Hazard Center is a group that helps communities and organizations understand and deal with anything that's dangerous to their survival. Dunu and the Hazard Center have worked with marginalized groups all over India, mainly in urban areas, and they're helping them face challenges and adapt to changing circumstances. Dunu is a chemical engineer by training, and he also describes himself as a social scientist by compulsion and a political ecologist by choice. And he's going to kick us off for today's discussion. Over to you, Dunu. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Audrey, very much for having invited me for this. Uh, I'll do a very brief presentation, basically to highlight the two phrases that have been used. One is community engagement and the other is sustainable cities and how uh, both kind of rebound on each other and in the process they tend to change the nature of understanding of the words themselves. Uh, so community engagement. Many years ago I was working with a group of us working in a slum in uh, Bombay and what occurred to us when you go and work in such areas is what you sense. It's not necessarily what the community wants. So as like all do-gooders do, we try to do good. And what struck us was a very strong sense of smell. This is an unassailable smell in all slums. It's essentially the smell of human shit. And uh, when it assails your nose, you think what a dirty place, something needs to be done about it. And uh, so, you know, this is typical engineering brains at work that what you need to do is build a toilet. So we started building a toilet and it was, this slum was kind of backed up against a little hill. And in front of it was a road which led to the main road. And we started building the toilet uh, right next to that exit onto the main road. Uh, this is where we got into community conversations because the women would pass by and they would see this odd looking bunch of fellows digging a hole in the ground. And they'd say, what are you doing? And we say, well, we are building a toilet. And they would say, oh, you are supposed to shit in that hole. So we said, yes. Then a little while later, we started putting the platform on it. 
And they said, now you put a platform on it, so where do we shit? So we said, you shit in the middle. They said, oh, the holes become smaller. Uh, then we said, yes, that's the nature of the toilet. Then uh, we put in the toilet seat, and they said, good God, you're making the target even smaller. You mean we've got to shit inside that little hole? We said, yes. And they said, and then what happens to the shit? And we said, well, you've got to wash it down. So, oh, now we need water too. And we said, yes, you'll need water. So they nodded their heads very sagely. And a little later, we started building the walls. And they said, what are you doing now? We said, we are building a room. You said, you mean you have a room to shit in? And we said, yes. Uh, then they said, but it's going to get dark in there. So he said, yeah, but then you'll have to put in a bulb. So they said, look, firstly, you're going to make us shit inside a room. Then you want us to get water. Then you want us to put in electricity. I mean, what are you trying to do? This is not what uh, perhaps uh, we understand. Then they said, and what happens to it when it goes inside that hole in the ground? And we said it gets connected to a sewer. So they said, what's a sewer? So we said, it's a pipe that leads underground, that goes out. So they said, and where does it go? And we said, well, eventually it'll go into the sea. And they said, but it's going to go into the dark, into the underground. There's going to be no air. So isn't it going to smell terribly? And then won't it pollute the sea? And to us, uh, well, that made sense. So we said, OK, what do you suggest we do? So they said, you come and see our sewer. And sewer in, uh, in Hindi means the pig. So they took us to the back of the slum. And they said, look, now this is the space where we come to shit in the morning. No room, no electricity, no water. And uh, it's an open space, which is protected by the rest of the slum. So we feel safe here because the rest of the slum is there to keep an eye, to see that nobody comes here. And it's a social space for us. We gather here to chat. This is probably the only time we get to relax and talk with each other. And we talk about family, we talk about problems, we share that. And they said, your toilet doesn't do all that. So why don't you do something about the sewer here, that is the pig, because the pig keeps nosing up our asses. Can you do something about the pig? So what I'm trying to illustrate is when communities really get engaged, they change the syntax of the language and its grammar. It begins to mean new things and new imaginations. And if those new imaginations are not uh, accepted or understood by do-gooders like us, uh, I think we've completely missed the bus. So that's as far as community engagement goes. Uh, to that, I would like to examine this idea of the sustainable city. Now, working in Delhi some years ago, uh, there were a large number of deaths of workers going down into septic tanks and sewers to clean them. And the deaths have been increasing over the last 15 years. Every year in, in, in Delhi itself, there are about 100 deaths of people going down into these sewers and septic tanks to clean them. So we did a little study with them. They asked us to come in and help them. So we did a little study. And what's remarkable is that they said these deaths started taking place about 20 years ago. And when we asked them, why do you think that happened? And they said road widening. And uh, road widening, we discovered, is essentially what happens is, is that as the road gets widened, these sewers are on the sides of the road. That's part of all urban infrastructure. And uh, they have vents at every 100 yards. Uh, when the sewers start getting widened, they begin to occupy the space over uh, the sewers, and the vents start disappearing. So the gas gets trapped inside the pipes. 
underground. And then later, what happens is that uh, uh, as the sewer lines get older, they start changing the pipes. And from the earlier glazed China pipes that were installed about 100 years ago, what we're now getting are concrete pipes, which uh, are rougher on the inside. So the, the uh, friction inside the pipe is higher. So ten, ten, things tend to get snagged inside the pipe. And the third thing is that the nature of sewage has changed. 20 years ago, there were no uh, sanitary napkins, there was no plastic, there was none of this acids that we are using to clean our toilets and so on. This was not, the phosphates were not entering the sewer lines. Now they are. So the density has become higher. So the nature of snagging inside the sewer gets higher. And because of that, people have to go down inside to free the sewer line so that they can flow again. Now for the, uh, this thing, this issue became a big issue and still is. So for the sewer workers, and they're all lower caste sewer workers, they all belong to what we call the untouchables. So they don't even appear in the caste regime in India. Uh, and uh, they are therefore the most vulnerable in the population. They get these jobs. They have to go down and clean it. And now there are two positions that are being taken. One is being taken by their organization's leaders who are saying, we will not do this dirty work anymore. It's a caste issue. We are getting out of it. And all of you stop going into sewers. The second is the position taken by the scientists and the technologists and by the judiciary, which says they shouldn't have to go down into the sewer. You mechanize the thing. You put in robots, which will go down into the sewer and clean the sewer. Now, both these propositions are somewhat untenable from the point of view of the sewer worker. The first one is untenable because uh, then they lose jobs. Uh, if they refuse to go down, they have to find alternative livelihoods. And in a period of uh, growth without jobs, it's becoming increasingly difficult to find any other kind of livelihood. And the second one is that from the point of view of the scientists, the moment you put a robo in, you're replacing a particular kind of worker by another kind of worker. The number of workers are going to come down and they'll be highly skilled workers who are going to be employed. So again, to lose livelihoods. So what is the option? And it's very interesting while discussing with them, they wanted to know about the chemistry and the microbiology of what happens inside the sewer. And their uh, logic was very simple. They said, it comes out of a pipe inside our body, which is devoid of air. And uh, there's lots of water inside it. And uh, it comes out into the fresh air and God must have ordained that it comes out because then it decomposes. But you engineers put it back into a pipe where there's no air, there's no light, and there's lots of water. So isn't there something wrong? Aren't we doing something wrong? So that's a challenge that we are beginning to take up of how do you do aerobic decomposition of human fecal matter? We've done some experiments already. It's about six times faster than anaerobic decomposition. It means that your shit has to be on the surface. It can't go underground. It has to be exposed to lots of sunlight, which we have lots of, and it should be devoid of water. So you're talking about a completely different system of fecal management. And if it changes, then actually the entire infrastructure of the city will begin to change and you'll get a different city of imagination where the taboos associated with fecal matter will have to disappear. It will have to be community management of some sort. And in addition, it will be out in the open. 
so mindsets will have to change of how to deal with such kind of fecal sludge. And uh, obviously, it can't be long pipelines underground. These have to be short structures over ground with space allocated for that. And uh, it actually changes the nature of decentralized local management of visible resources. So that is something that I think leads to an idea of a sustainable city. Uh, I think I'll stop there with these two examples. I have lots more. Uh, as you can see from the color of my hair, uh, there's a lot under there, uh, although it's balding. Uh, but I would be happy to share more of these experiences and the science behind them, provided, of course, we have time. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dino, for sharing these stories and talking about how community engagement changes the, the syntax and the grammar and the very way that we see problems, I think is an excellent way to, to kick us off. I'm going to, to pass the baton on to our next speakers. Before I do, I just want to check that she's still with us. Priyanka, are you still here? Yes. Hi, Audrey. Oh, fantastic. So let me introduce you. Uh, Priyanka Sharma is a, is a planner by training, and she's currently lead <laughs> for urban development at the civil society organization EGJUT, which is based in Ranchi uh, in Jharkhand in eastern India. So Priyanka's work focuses on understanding homeless people's lives and needs in order to try to improve the realization of their rights and access to entitlements. So her work really speaks to the topic of inclusive urbanization. And it's all the more important in the time of COVID where cities are facing challenges in providing safe accommodation and reducing the risk of infection for homeless people. So Priyanka is going to talk about um, the, the issue of inclusion and also I believe about research with vulnerable communities in the context of community engagement. Over to you Priyanka. Uh, thank you so much Audrey uh, for the introduction and uh, I I think I'm going to uh, start my uh, discussion with a small story because uh, uh, for the next eight to 10 minutes, I will be talking about uh, the idea of inclusion and how we are looking at the issue of uh, housing and homelessness uh, in the state of uh, Jharkhand. So um, I, when I graduated from uh, my planning school, um, and uh, I joined almost eight years ago, a uh, migrant organization. So I received a call from my friend and he, we were sort of having a discussion on, you know, how, we, because this is my first uh, job. Uh, so he was, we were kind of exchanging, you know, uh, the ideas, like how we are planning to go about our career and all. So I was sharing that, you know, I have joined an organization and uh, I, we plan to work uh, with the urban homeless people. So the first reaction that, uh, you know, came from my friend was, you know, are you really sure about it? Because, um, you know, these people are, I guess, criminals and uh, they are often engaged in unlawful activities. So, you know, just, just think about it, whether you are sure to, you know, take up uh, this particular uh, thing. So after uh, this whole discussion, I started thinking that, you know, um, whether I was really sure about it. And after, uh, you know, a month or two, I actually uh, read a lot. There were orientations program that I attended on this topic and that changed my perspective. Uh, I was then determined that, you know, the idea of the urban that my friend had in his mind needs to be changed because there is a very, there is a flip side to it also. Um, so when we started working in Egypt almost eight years ago on the issues of uh, housing and homelessness, uh, we tried to, you know, explore um, the people's perception. And that's how we started. You know, we went on the streets and uh, we, uh, asked people that, you know, how do they perceive an urban space? So the, the largely the responses were around, you know, that the urban space uh, should have um, high rise building, huge skylines, uh, restaurants and eateries, shopping complexes. Uh, there'll be a lot of malls. 
and the people should look urban so i and and modern th- those were the words so you know this is uh, th- this is this was the you know first step where you know we try to uh, engage with people and the homeless com- uh, community itself because we wanted you know to present uh, the very with the very um, flip side of the visual of an urban space so we tried to you know peep beyond uh, the mental uh, glamour of the urban city where uh, the truth is that uh, you know it also renders innumerable men and women and children who lives in the most you know in human conditions uh, you know their situations uh, is often escaped by the eyes of uh, you know people or the rather most part of it is ignored so we thought that you know we should at least try uh, to first establish the fact that there is a group in the urban sphere who are the most vulnerable and uh, they always you know they are almost invisible because nobody knows who are they how their lives are what are the issues and challenges they're facing so through this work we have actually established that you know the majority of population the homeless population are the ones who are employed and contribute to the city economies in significant ways um, you know but they are often denied of the the human rights and uh, which also includes the constitutional rights and they even lack uh, the access to uh, basic you know infrastructure that they should be entitled to so the first uh, i think uh, issue that we tried to address through this work was to create a lot of uh, you know evidences uh, that would establish the fact that number one uh, they are not criminals they are uh, not into begging they are the ones who are actually working uh, you know day and night to uh, to actually build the city uh so i'll i'll you know i'll try to highlight a one significant issue and the challenge that we faced while we were working with the uh, government uh, advocating for uh, different rights and entitlements for them um i'll start with uh, the data the lack of uh, data or the information that is available online and offline and even with the government uh in 2011 census that the uh, government of india conducts every 10 years says that you know india has a total population of around 9 lakhs uh, 9.5 lakhs in india and jharkhand in particular has around 23000 uh, you know homeless residents that were those were counted in 2011 so we plan to conduct a similar head count survey in uh, 2015 june and uh, we ended up counting almost 6500 homeless residents alone in uh, you know uh, 55 wards of uh, the city and then we went uh, you know taking up these issues that you know actually uh, somewhere miss, we are missing out the numbers and if we miss out the numbers then definitely they will end up uh, you know uh, being excluded in the policies the reforms and the programs that are actually designed to uh, mitigate poverty uh, so uh, the government the, so these were like this is the one area that has been very you know neglected or there is a big gap um, also this was on the numbers also there was a lack of uh, you know the real qualitative data also uh, that you know what is their lifestyle uh, where these people are actually uh, engaged in the city what is their daily living because these are the you know information which actually helps uh, ultimately planning the facilities for the urban homeless population um when we uh, did the survey uh, in the headcount survey in 2015 we plan to conduct an another in depth survey with them in 2016 the next year almost after uh, an year gap and we found that you know the very elementary facilities of uh, you know like which actually uh, provide them the indian citizenship like their voter id cards the identity cards uh, were not with them so uh, this was the first step where we you know tried to address uh, the situation 
So we started exploring the shelter home. That's this is a government-run facility uh, for uh, the homeless people. So we started working with them, and uh, we have trained almost uh, almost more than you know hundred agencies in Jharkhand who are actually running the uh, shelter homes, and we also trained them on uh, you know providing uh, facilities to them, providing medical aid. Uh, addressing health issues and in linking them with uh, different government facilities. Um, another area I think which uh, is very important to highlight when we talk about, you know, uh, making the city inclusive and making the homeless people actually visible in the urban spheres is, you know, creating the evidences and uh, having some really scientific uh, tools to uh, establish uh, the real picture of uh, the urban homeless population. Um, uh, to actually address uh, the situation and make this solution sustainable for them and viable, uh, we need to have specifications of the issues. And I'll, I'll share an incident. Uh, in 2016, the government of India announced a program, uh, a very aspirational mission of their called Smart City Mission. And uh, uh, this mission was actually um, announced to make a comprehensive development, which is on the front of, uh, you know, infrastructure, physical, social development. And the main idea was to promote uh, public participation. Okay, so the 100 cities of uh, in the country were selected to uh, for this mission. And uh, in 2017, Rachi was uh, announced as one of the city selected for smart city mission. Uh, when we were working, uh, it, it was almost four and a half years into the intervention. We were working with the shelter homes. We were working with uh, the agencies, the networks who were uh, working uh, for the vulnerable groups in urban uh, communities. So we uh, got an information from one slum that you know they have received an eviction uh, notice from the government because um, under the smart city mission, there was uh, going to be there was a park, a green space which was going to be constructed. So the 144 families were uh, asked to actually leave that space uh, within a notice of uh, 15, 20 days. And uh, uh, this happened when we were actually developing our own idea of you know preventing the homelessness, uh, you know because uh, with our own experience we. Uh, we understood that it's very important to actually uh, have some interventions, uh, you know, where we can work uh, in partnership with the governments, with the civil society, to actually make this system and uh, more responsive towards the needs. And, you know, uh, because evictions uh, render thousands and hundreds of people homeless, you know, within a very short span. So this had to be uh, addressed somewhere. We started um, engaging with the community after they received the notice. And after three long years of, uh, you know, continuous our in engagement with that community, uh, all of them recently, I think last month uh, during the lockdown, uh, all of them were rehabilitated in the government run uh, permanent uh, houses. Uh, so they were allotted uh, the permanent housing uh, facility. Uh, I feel that, you know, this happens because there is a lack of, you know, understanding amongst the department uh, and uh, the office, government offices, which are actually, uh, you know, responsible to implement welfare programs for the urban homeless population, because there are no vulnerability studies done, there is no pre-assessment uh, of the situation which is done. So there is a lot of, uh, and you know, there is no standard, um, you know, benchmark created, you know, that these are the steps which has to be followed, you know, before the community uh, receives the notice of eviction or anything like that. Uh, so these yeah, are that's, the... That's really useful. I think we're coming to, to time. So we're okay, getting... I'll, I'll just conclude my, uh, my discussion in just two minutes <laughs> or even one minute. Okay. The problem and the complexity associated uh, with the homelessness and uh, poverty uh, we have understood that it requires several stages of, uh, you know, prevention, intervention, and systematic, system-based based response solution. Uh, so the policy response, I think, uh, you know, requires an urgent, uh, there is an urgent need 
to uh, move away from the discussions on you know general welfare policies uh, to context specific policies um, otherwise i think uh, the aspirations of uh, the sustainable development or the smart cities mission uh, is going to be the castle in the air uh, i'll end of my discussion uh, here thank you so much uh, over to you audrey brilliant thanks so much priyanka we, we have a question um, about uh, from one of the members in the audience, what cities are model cities that we should be aiming to emulate? So I might ask you and, uh, and Duna perhaps to reflect on this as I, as I introduce Emily and as, uh, as we hear her talk. So our, our next speaker is Dr. Emily Morris. Um, Emily is a development economist uh, specializing in Latin America and in the Caribbean. She's currently based at the UCL Institute of the Americas. She's been a senior editor and economist uh, for Latin America and head of country reports at the Economist Intelligence Unit in London. She's also been the country economist for Belize at the Inter-American Development Bank. She has established uh, the UCL Cuba Research Network, and she's currently doing work to formulate an environmentally, economically, and socially sustainable transport strategy for the city of Havana in Cuba. And she's going to be talking to us about that. Emily, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about our project. Um, first of all, uh, what I'd like to do is just quickly do two things. I've done the presentation that people can download. Um, I just want to talk very briefly about the characteristics of Havana in particular. And then I'll talk a bit about our research collaboration and the structure of it and what we've done. Um, in terms of Havana, uh, you know, Havana is a famous city, it's a very important city um, globally, and it's a magnificent place, but we know that the infrastructure in Havana has been become very, very dilapidated. Um, there was a kind of minimal investment, well, a low level of investment even before the 1990s, but then we had a crisis in the 1990s, um, and so all of the infrastructure deteriorated, housing, water, transport, a lot. Um, but what we have now is an opportunity um, to do something about it. The economy has been recovering, apart from the latest um, difficulties that they've had uh, partly as a result of um, uh, US sanctions, but also obviously COVID. But the recovery was beginning. We're moving towards um, being able to, to invest again in, in Havana. Um, but it's a great opportunity actually because Cuba has ex escaped the urban planning of the 1960s and 70s. There wasn't enough investment during that period to um, take the leap into car oriented urban development. And so what you have is, um, that's why we're focusing on mobility because Havana has a unique pattern of urban mobility with very um, uh, public transport based um, with a structure, an urban structure, which is less, because they haven't had markets, less ghettoized and gentrified on both sides. Um, and we've also got a very strong commitment on the part of the government to the sustainable development goals in general. But the need for a vision for urban mobility at the moment is very urgent, partly because if and when the money finally arrives, because at the moment they have very, very little access to international finance, but it looks like it will be coming soon. Um, you very much need a vision so as not to make the mistakes that other places have made. And so our project is really about developing the vision. There's also a process of reform going on in Cuba, which is a necessary one, but it also adds a lot of new hazards and risks, in particular in relation to increasing inequality, urban inequality. Um, so now to talk about our research collaboration. First, I must say that it's not my vision and it's not UCL doing the vision. It's very much being done by our partners at the um, Technological University of Havana. Um, there's a team of people there and as my paper describes or our paper describes, they've been working on this issue for a very long time with a lot of different partners. And so they, they actually lead the program. Unfortunately, they couldn't participate today as presenters because we have difficulties um, with communication, partly because of US sanctions actually, because they don't, um, there's a lot of software uh, that they can't get access to. So I'm presenting on their behalf. 
they have a very clear idea. They've been working on the new urban agenda for a long time. They can clearly see that they need to have the vision. They can clearly, they've been building up huge networks of other um, people who work in this area, but also very importantly, their research is linked to their teaching, which is linked to engagement because their students are required to go out into communities and do their projects there. They're, they're, they're in the Department of Urban Planning and Architecture. Um, and so they've developed a model where they're constantly engaging with the local authorities and with local communities in the developing a, a whole range of projects. So they, and then, so the work we've been doing, they've been leading the, the work, we've been supporting them, and they've been developing a whole series of pilots of interventions that can be done in order to improve the urban environment and mobility and accessibility with the focus on the least advantaged groups or the disadvantaged groups. So that's in terms of neighborhoods. So that the most rundown um, neighborhoods, the overcrowded ones or the isolated ones. And in terms of populations within those neighborhoods. So you'd be talking about the disabled, the old people, of course, have had a very high um, rapidly aging population, um, but also in capacity building, capacity building with the authorities because the authorities a lot of the changes that are happening now are new to them. There's a decentralization process going on. They've got to build their capacity within the communities to look at the um, possibilities because after years of um, having no finance at all, people's imaginations have been stunted by this. You know, if we had money, what would we do? What would you do first? Do we really want to just think about getting a car each or do we want to think about how we're going to organize the city so that everybody has access? Um, and so, so I've said that the whole thing is being done by our partners, but I just want to say something about the collaboration between us in the UK and the Cubans, because that I think that we do add something important, apart from a bit of funding, and a little bit of funding goes a very long way in Cuba, because they have so many organisations with them that they're working with. <clears throat> but we, what we have with them is a, what we call an umbrella collaboration. So it's not just a project or even a um, you know, a set of scheduled projects. It's an umbrella collaboration where we're working on the issues and then when, if and when there is somebody who could go over there who has particular expertise or particular experience in other cities, we arrange that or we arrange for the Cubans, the academics and even the people from the authorities to come travel to other countries and see things. So we, we enable the knowledge sharing, the international knowledge sharing, as well as providing the funding to make the workshops and activities happen. And we also finally um, contribute to their capacity to disseminate, to, to let the world know what they're doing in, in Havana. And um, so for that reason, I thank you very much for letting me join in this meeting today. And I'm going to come to a, an, an end there. Um, I hope I've done it well within time to allow lots of time for discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Emily, that's great. And uh, we might turn to you with some questions related to the regulation of, of cars uh, in, in cities that you can see on Slido as well. Um, our final speaker is a fantastic politician. Um, she's been the deputy mayor of London and she's currently the member of the, the London Assembly. Nikki Gavron established the London Climate Change Agency and the C40 Large Cities Climate Leadership Group. She's a long-term champion of neighborhood planning processes, and she's currently uh, engaged in responding to the UK government's white paper on planning, which is called Planning for the Future. Uh, this paper is proving uh, very controversial. The mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has, uh, has characterized it as a nakedly ideological assault on local democracy. So Nikki's been uh, very busy indeed in the last few days with this. Um, and she's going to share a bit of her experience on, on neighborhood planning and her current work with us. Nikki. Thank you very much for that introduction. I've been so interested to hear from our other speakers because um, of course London's, you know, homelessness, sewage, transport, and vision for transport, all these are issues that we are also grappling with and have grappled with. I'm, um, I'm going to talk about there are lots and lots of ways of having um, engagement um, to make a sustainable city for citizens to be engaged and lots and lots of participatory ways. But I'm going to focus on neighbourhood planning, mainly because um, it's legal, it's got teeth. 
So it's a good mixture of soft power and hard power. Now, I'm, I'm the only politician on the platform, but I didn't begin as a career politician. And um, I set out originally, I was just a, a young mother bringing up children, but I got very involved in community, voluntary community action. I was a community activist for a lot of years, um, first in my local area and then further afield. But what really got me into politics um, was when the GLC was abolished in 86. And I had to make the community case against the abolition of the GLC, London government. And I was so, I, anyway, it just catalyzed me into government. But I also had another ambition, which was to see what you could do from the inside as a supportive politician to communities. I chose, I chose to focus on planning when I became a politician because I'd already learned that um, if you want to have a sustainable city, you need joined up policies. And planning is holistic, it's about integrated policies. And also it's very, um, it's, you know, the environment is very central in it and it's the environment that we all live in and share. I, the first thing I did, I became chair of planning and the first thing I did with my, with the planners was to suggest that we, we introduced a neighborhood plan and I chose the area in which I was the ward councillor because it was an area of great change and I had a lot of experience of it. And um, we worked together to produce a neighbourhood plan. And I wanted to show that um, we can empower communities to shape um, growth and renewal in their area. And it was, um, it was a great experience. And it, we used teachers and, and children and, and community workers. It was all a very different day, but it was time consuming. It was, well, mainly labour intensive and it was therefore costly. And there were cuts in the 90s. So sadly, neighbourhood planning in that form didn't survive. Now I want to fast forward to neighbourhood planning now. Now, um, I just want to give you a little bit of context because I'm going to talk about neighbourhood planning across London. But I want to just say that in the last 25 years, London's population has grown by almost 2 million people. And the development pressures in the planning system are enormous. And many, many communities, many citizens feel, um, and I agree with them, that in fact, their knowledge, their experience, their efforts, their aspirations, even if they're listened to, are dismissed and at worst just trampled on. So, so I just, sorry, I lost my flow there, just trampled on. And, um, and it's, it, it was therefore, I just want to, it was therefore, I've got to go back a little bit, but it was therefore very promising. I want to talk about the beginning of neighbor planning in London um, under this government, rather it was a coalition government, but the coalition government in 2011 decided that they were going to introduce a new form of planning, neighbor planning under the Localism Act. And they said it was because they wanted to disperse power more widely. Now that was music to our ears, that's great. And this neighborhood planning that they introduced was gave the right and the power, and remember citizens felt pretty powerless, gave the right and the power to citizens to come together to in fact make a plan um, which would shape their areas. And it was going to be, it was statutory, and it was going to be a new tier of planning, a statutory tier. Now this was very, and is very significant for London because London has so many deprived communities in need of regeneration. But this means change for communities. And I know from experience that change is scary. People, people don't, don't feel they have a say and they don't feel in control, which is why neighbor planning is so, so very important and the introduction of it. The assembly, and I lead on, um, I have led, I'm alternately chair and deputy chair of the planning committee on the assembly, has been tracking neighbor planning. And we did a, we did a report um, which was published in March this year. And we, we investigated what was happening and we were absolutely struck by the passion and the dedication of the participants in neighbor planning from all sorts of backgrounds and in many, many geographical settings across London. And we asked them how they started. What got them started, we said. And they said, well, there were lots of different reasons, but for instance, what got them started was 
that they wanted to save something from being lost. It might have been a favorite pub, but also, sadly, it could have been their homes. Or they started because they wanted to make their area just better. They wanted to have more, public, more open space, extend open space, plant trees, make workshops for local people, breathe life into a failing high street. And in a few cases, people started, and there's one exceptional one, started from the fact that they wanted to change restrictive policies and our records on them succeeding. Now, all of them had to reach out to people. They all had to have a lot of people involved. And they started through the conventional channels of talking to groups, faith groups, traders groups, etc. And then they had to find people who were not normally involved. So going door to door to the estates, all sorts of ways were used to involve people. The process is very protracted. I won't go through all the stages because of time, but in fact, there are many stages. And finally, you come to a referendum and there's a poll. And if the vote is more than 50%, then the plan is submitted to the local authority who've actually had to see many of these stages, who then can or cannot make the plan a legal entity and legally binding. All our participants, had lots of stamina because they went through this arduous process, which can take between three and five years. But they all said the following, and it's really crucial, that the process was key, absolutely key, for building social value and community cohesion. We also heard that there are all sorts of ways in which communities or citizen communities who are not experts in the conventional sense have come up with really innovative suggestions. And these, as far as I can see, are often born out of these new suggestions, these new innovations and inventions are born out of necessity and an acute understanding of a community's own priorities, their local priorities. And to just give you one example, which is not very far from UCL in Kentish Town, um, the Kentish Town Forum, who made the Kentish Town Neighbourhood Plan, very, very much wanted more housing for young people housing for people, rented housing, all sorts of housing, massive lack and desperate need for it. And they, they saw there was a bit of, it's quite a large bit actually, of underused employment industrial site along a railway line, quite close to the main road. And they said, and the council had absolutely was against this, Camden Council. And they said, look, we absolutely think you should be densifying or intensifying, making more, you can even make more employment space, but not if you leave it as one and two stories. And so, and then, then you can make way for housing. And the council's mindset was changed. Now this is a win-win all round. The developers were happy, the businesses were happy, the employers were happy, the council was happy, and the community was happy. Now, often planning is about who wins and who loses. And this is an example of value being shared, which is where I think planning really ought to be. Now, not all councils are like Camden Council. Not all are supportive. There are barriers. They put obstacles in the way. They don't promote neighbor planning. Citizens don't know about it. And also there are other barriers. The grant the government gives is very meager. And then, and then there are technical surveys and data and evidence that has to be found. And this is asking a lot of volunteers. And this is where I want to bring in universities because I do think universities have a big role to play here. And in fact, UCL and the Faculty of the Built Environment have done just that. They have worked with neighborhood planners and participants and um, sometimes over a long time, but certainly to boost their um, survey and evidence work. Now, where's neighborhood planning now? Well, we're in the time of COVID and COVID has shown and turned a spotlight, heightened our understanding of the extreme inequalities that are still in this city. We see people in tower blocks, households, overcrowded, multi-generational families. They can't open the windows. They can't get down to open space. They haven't got gardens, they haven't even got balconies. We see people who can't any longer feed themselves or their families. We see people isolated, isolated mentally and physically. And the spotlight has now been turned on enormous amount 
of community and grassroots activity, actually cooperating with councils. And we can see, it's staggering actually what's happening, the way people, citizens, groups, businesses, etc., have formed virtual networks and they're working together to actually make sure that there is food that can feed the hungry and to deal with the crisis of food banks. Now just also, of course, COVID has helped us to understand our neighbourhoods. We're reclaim we've been reclaiming the streets. We know what it's like now to live without traffic. Nikki, we sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm going to give you a few few seconds to make I'll some up. I'll wind up. I just wanted to say, and all this is augurs well for neighbour planning, but there's a paradox because just as it looks as though neighbour planning could really take off because people understand their neighbourhood, the um, government has come in and unleashed all these reforms which strip away democratic accountability and certainly will diminish the role of neighbour planning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. That's really fascinating. I'm going to hand over to Paul Eakins, who's been monitoring the, the questions on chat. Yes, hello everyone. And um, fascinating questions. And uh, uh, as you will know on Slido, you have a chance to uh, vote which questions uh, you think are particularly interesting or which you want asked. And you can see on your screens, the ones that have got most of these votes. Um, uh, I, I think there's a, an appetite in some of the questions that I've been looking at uh, to get uh, kind of practical examples um, of some of the very important issues that you've all been talking about. And uh, we can start with that one at the top that has the most votes. Uh, is there such a thing as a model city? And um, uh, should we be trying to emulate it? We've heard about many different sorts of cities today, Havana, London, a couple of cities in India. Um, so are people working to a kind of blueprint in their mind about what a model city might be? Or do you have to start from where, what you find and then see if you can improve it in certain, certain sorts of ways? So um, some comments with the questions. I, I don't think all panelists need to respond to all of them. Some of them are quite specific about particular things that we've been talking about. And then I'll ask a particular panelist to respond to that. But this seems a pretty fundamental one. And so um, why, don't, uh, why don't we go to uh, Duno and ask uh, him uh, if, he think, if he thinks in terms of a model city? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. It also, I think, reflects our mindset that there's a bunch of people searching for a model city uh, and that these bunch of people are the ones who are going to determine what the cities of the future are going to be. I tend to somewhat disagree with this mindset itself. Uh, the vision that is there has to be in terms of daily living. What is it that I like about my daily life that I want to carry further, build upon, and take beyond that? If I start with that as my platform, then I would say there's a model city embedded in virtually every slum across across India, at least. The, the slum, it represents a kind of community living, community approach that is fundamental to the manner in which people relate with each other, make do with minimal resources, are able to subserve with their labor a much larger population. And therefore, my challenge would be, can one conceive of the slum as the model itself and build upon? Well, thank you, Duna. There's a creative response for you. Um, uh, the slum is the model city and building on that. Uh, over to you, Emily, uh, with your experiences in Havana. Okay, yeah, I, I think, um... Yeah, the problem with the model is it's kind of a static idea that there's some ideal that exists sometime in the future. And, and really, we're not talking about that. We're talking about what we can do now um, under the current circumstances. And I agree with the previous speaker that we have to learn from, we have to think about what, what we've got at the moment and what's good about it and reflect on that and appreciate that. And I think in the case of Havana, what we're looking at is actually, I and mean, we've talked a lot about the idea of a leapfrogging. 
because if, if have, people in Havana, obviously they have a lot of problems, but if they are, are aware of some of the mistakes that have been made elsewhere, then they can see what they've got, which is a low car density, um, a lot of people walking and um, active travel. If they can maintain what they've got and work with that and learn from the mistakes made elsewhere, um, then they can, they can actually you know, move from where they are to something pretty good very quickly. So, um, but that's, I think very much is the idea that it's not um, a final model. Nobody has a picture of exactly what it'll look like, but a city is the definition of a city is it's constantly changing with the new people that come and go and all the rest of it. So I'll just say that. Yeah, lovely, thank you. And um, so Nikki, you've been working in London for a long time. Um, are you moving to, towards anything that resembles a model city or do you think that that's also um, not, not the right way to frame this kind of discussion? Well, I, um, when I came in as deputy mayor, I gave our mayor a vision, which was to make London an exemplary sustainable world city. And I said, if it wasn't sustainable, it wouldn't be a world city. It wouldn't work as a city for its residents. It's work in progress, um, Paul. It takes a long time. And, um, and there are areas in which I think we're doing well and other areas where I think we've got a lot, a lot to do and to repair and to learn from other cities. But I just wanted to say, when, when I was involved in setting up the C40, which is cities collaborating to cut carbon and learn from each other, it was because I'd learned so much from other cities. And I think there is, I agree with, our, with um, what Emily, there's no one model. And um, I thought what Juna said was really interesting and very creative. And I think what the C40 does is to, is to I mean, they're, they're good things in all cities. They're things, to they're things to emulate and learn from, but you have to apply it to the particular context of the city. And I think um, that's exactly, I think what the C40 is trying to do. As far as the city, which I think had almost the best citizen engagement I've ever come across, it's Seoul. And unfortunately, Mayor Park, wonderful mayor, came from civil society, introduced so much citizen engagement to make Seoul more sustainable. And he, he sadly died now. But I mean, there are lots of wonderful examples. Right. So Priyanka, um, we've had one view from um, the slums of India. What, what's, your, what's your answer to that question? Um. I think I'd agree largely with uh, the previous speakers because uh, in the Indian context, especially for the urban areas, I don't think we can, you know, go from for one specific model because these uh, spaces are an ever changing, um, ever changing spheres. And uh, I think rather than going for or citing for a model cities concept, we should go with, um, you know, the participation of uh, the citizens, the ideas that lies in, I think, every slum which Dunu mentioned. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, it was interesting that this question came up because, you know, certainly we as a team working with the homeless are also, you know, um, asked that what do you think is can be a model for actually running the shelter or actually to address the situation of homelessness. But we always say that there cannot be, you know, one particular solution which can be, you know, implemented in different areas. So, yeah. Really interesting. Thank you, um, Anonymous. Thank you for that question, which uh, produced some really creative answers. Uh, the next one on my list, I'm rather ashamed to say, comes from me. And I'm going to start with Emily on this because um, this is the motor car, which um, uh, has been hegemonic in certainly Western cities for rather a long time. And um, I'm fascinated to hear how you think Havana might uh, leapfrog and avoid uh, that particular phenomenon, if, if indeed you think it, it should and will. Um, and then we'll go to some of the other cities um, because I think all cities are struggling with what to do with this, uh, this particular beast that has uh, so many good things about it, but also so many disadvantages. So, Emily. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the idea from our point of view, from the people in, in London looking at Havana, we could see that they had a, a really unique opportunity in that sense, because it has got some of the lowest car ownership. And the issue is when we're talking about models, of course, the Cubans, the, the cities that the Cubans know most outside of Cuba are in the US. 
And so that model, that, that aspiration of having a car and being able to move around is very much there on the individual level. And so in a way, what we're doing is we're, we're um, opening up the discussion to look at what's happened elsewhere, to look at the issues about obviously the unsustainability of the, the US model with their very low density and their car dependency, and to look at the alternatives. And, and actually the Cubans get it very quickly. I mean, that, that's been an interesting experience with talking to people in the community workshops and all the rest of it. They know that what they really want is to be able to walk around more easily, for them to have access to what they need to get to, um, and to have a good public transport system. And so we've been working, we've been working on lots of different levels. One of the projects that we did um, was a specific one, which was on mapping the city in terms of movement and place. You know, the conflict between the, the mobility through a place and mobility within a place. And so we've mapped the city with students and with people in the communities to, to, to look at you know, those conflicts that there are and how you think about that, that problem. We've also been looking at um, low carbon transport, but not only electric vehicles and all the rest of it, but also bicycles and um, non-motorized mobility. So um, I think you know, what we've learned in Europe very clearly is, is that there is, you know, it's a, it's a dead end. If, you're, if you develop a city which is car dependent, it's a dead end, not only because of all the pollution and all the rest of it, but the congestion as well. And the other aspects, we've had people talking about transport and health and the, the need for active travel and what a difference that makes to, to how healthy people are, particularly non-communicable diseases. So yeah, we've been working with a meteorological office, measuring the, the, um, the transport related pollution and so on. So all of this information gathering contributes to the discussion and to the development of a vision. We've been very, very lucky with two things. One is that the local Havana's transport authority is um, a new unitary transport authority with a planning department who are very keen on, on doing things sustainably and working out a new vision. And we've also just to hit the right moment in terms of government policy because the government has decided partly because they can't get finance from outside anyway and they need to um, develop their economy um, if you like, from their own resources, they do have a lot of very good universities with a lot of people with a lot of capacity for research. And so the linking between universities and communities and producers is one something that's fully encouraged at the moment. So we've been very fortunate to be hitting it at this moment. So I think that there's a lot we can do in Havana. Havana won't be a model city because it's a unique city, but nonetheless, I think there's loads of things that can happen there, which um, maybe um, we have the right conditions, apart from money. We don't have money. You don't have money. Well, perhaps if you did have money, you'd have more cars, because that's been a reasonably, um, been a, a reasonably common thing. So India, a fast developing, uh, fast developing country, emerging economy. Presumably, the aspiration for private car ownership there is as strong as it is in many other countries, or you may contradict me. Um, Priyanka, what's your perception about motorized transport in Indian cities? Um, I think uh, owning a car and, uh, you know, having a car in India is often looked at as uh, uh, being a sign of uh, a well-to-do, coming from a well-to-do background. So I would say that uh, as, uh, as the family, you know, economic status improves, this, the first thing that you'll see the family is going to get uh, after uh, buying a house is car. I think in Jharkhand we have a uh, you know we have a network of different uh, agencies or civil society who works on different issues and there is an agency who's working on transportation related issues and we often have this discussion that you know what do you think that how Rachi is going to be after you know 10 years down the line when we see uh, you know the traffic's on the road and they say that you know we are on the track of uh, being a city like Patna who's the capital of Bihar um, having very bad uh, air quality because of uh, the traffic and uh, you know the car or the four wheeler occupying the most space on the roads. So um, yeah, I think it's 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 a very um, challenging situation for the Indian cities as to how to reduce you know the emitation uh, the pollution. You know how can we reduce the cars, the motor vehicles on the roads because in the long run it is going to create. Uh, leave a very, very uh, ill effect on uh, the health and the other things as well. 
Yeah, really interesting, those kinds of conflicts and uh, human aspirations. Nikki, I'm going to turn to you because I'm obviously a Londoner uh, like you. Um, and we've seen with COVID, we've seen uh, a complete shutdown. So far fewer cars on the road than with the opening up, far more cars on the road. Um, great arguments about lower traffic neighborhoods in different councils, should cars be restricted around schools, et cetera, et cetera. A great, very controversial issue. And now this latest proposal from the government to extend the congestion charge uh, very broadly uh, in order to fund London transport, which I found uh, quite ironic given that it was Boris Johnson himself when he was mayor of London who rolled back the congestion charge from the area in which it, uh, it was then operating in Kensington and Chelsea. So um, uh, before you answer, I'll just draw people's attention to the opportunities for voting here. I'm fascinated that it looks as if lots more people are walking and cycling. Um, certain number of people haven't changed their behavior. Not much more public transport and not much more driving. So um, if that were representative of the wider population, which I suspect it probably isn't, then certainly we'd be moving towards a less motorized cities in uh, whichever cities we're talking about there. But anyway, over to you, Nikki, and, and on this question of transport, which I know is something that's occupied yeah. you for many years. Yes, it has, because I was very involved in, in um, making the case for congestion charging in the 90s. I got the idea from Trondheim in Norway, which had the system that we've got at the moment, which is a paper-based system. Um, and um, yes, and also was very involved in it coming in when I was deputy mayor with Ken. And there was hysterical opposition to it, but afterwards, you know, people accepted it. And um, in the, I just want to say about something about the current situation at the moment, because I think 80% of London's public realm are streets. That's a huge amount. And in fact, these are, you know, these are public goods, public assets are streets, and we just can't give them over to the cars we know. This mayor has made, Sadiq Khan, has made tackling London's very toxic, deadly air quality, almost, you know, one of his top pursuits, top, top challenges. And he's doing, you know, London is a world leader, um, although there's lots more to do, but we're a world leader in terms of addressing air quality and the mayor wants is going to he's already got the ultra low emission zone and he's going to extend that next year now the government i just think it's been so totally punishing of london because the mayor has actually reduced um following boris he's actually made lots of efficiency savings reduced the amount of um funding um sorry finance reduced finance um inefficient finance um in, trans, in Transport for London, TfL. But at the same time, Boris left him a legacy of taking away the subsidy where the only city in the world, major city, that doesn't have a major, yeah, major city in the Western world that doesn't have a subsidy for its public transport. And the mayor, of course, with COVID, 90% of, um, of um, passengers are reduced from buses and tubes. So, and we get, you know, Unlike many other cities, we have very few resources, very few levers of power, very few actual, very, not much authority actually, in a way, and income from congestion charging and income from fares are our main income. Now the government's come in and says, okay, you know, um, we, we want you now to extend the congestion charge. Now this is not the time to extend the congestion charge. And they're actually making it seven days a week and they want to extend it right to the North and South Circular. And that, that'll be on top of the ULES. It'll be very expensive. This is absolutely not the time because there are too many people who will not be able to use public transport. However, in the long run, we should be producing, there should be congestion charging, in my view, in many in cities, because it's a way of raising funding and it's a way of taming the car. And I think it should be a much more sophisticated system because now we have the ability to have a chip in the car. We have the ability to make sure that you can charge according to journey length. You can, you can make it exempt for shift workers. You can charge according to emissions. There are all sorts of ways that you could make it much more equitable 
than the current congestion charge system is. So in the long run, that, but in the short run, no. In the short run, let's deal with air quality. Now the low traffic neighborhoods are about air quality and giving more space to citizens, reclaiming streets. But there's been a backlash, as you indicated, Paul, from some of the motorists. And I have to agree, in some cases, it went in without community buy-in, without community consultation. And it's really highlighted how important it is if you want to make change, you've got to involve communities in that change. Yeah, thanks. So well, that takes us right back to the main topic of this uh, um, of, of, of this uh, event uh, about com about communities. Dunu, is this conversation relevant to you working in the slums of in the slums of Bombay? A small correction: I don't work in the slums. Oh, I'm sorry, of Bombay. I work wherever people call our team. Uh, the, I just wanted to make three quick points, if I may, uh, to bring this conversation uh, to some element of grassroots reality. First, uh, sustainability. What does sustainability mean? Are we trying to sustain the present mode of development, which is what the SDGs suggest? So, for example, the SDGs will say we shall remove poverty, but in the process they are saying that we'll remove poverty by having more of this development. Uh, so there seems to be no linkage between development and how it creates poverty. So if this form of development, for instance, were responsible for creating poverty, then poverty cannot be removed by having more of this development. So this is a, a kind of a dilemma, which I think we all have to look at. And I'm just going to offer you some figures. If you're talking about sustainability of nature, let's just take climate change. Then per capita consumption of energy cannot exceed anything that releases more than two tons of carbon dioxide per person. That is the global figure. Now, if I convert that figure into how much people are earning and releasing in terms of energy consumption and therefore carbon dioxide equivalent, then in India, anybody who earns over 10,000 rupees per month is actually exceeding the limit. So that's a real figure I have to wrestle with. Now, either I say that means that everybody earns only 10,000 in the interest of equality. Nobody is going to be permitted to earn more than 10,000 because that's good for the earth. Learn to live within 10,000. Learn to live with whatever you think poverty is or is not. So that's a hard figure. And what does it mean for a sustainable city? See, the car is out of the equation. The car does not come into this picture at all if we take it as sustainable nature. The second point that I wish to make is, you know, there's this there's this kind of implicit assumption that as we get more affluent, as we come out of poverty, we'll all want a car. This is not true. The car is required for longer distances. If you are within two kilometers of work, you walk. If you're within five kilometers, you cycle. If you are 10 kilometers, you bus. You don't need the car, provided your city is organized around that principle, which is why I think this land use planning that we use for planning our cities is something problematic. It's not land use we should be looking at. We should be looking at energy use. And I see currently no effort being made by urban planners to engage with that issue. And the third and final point, which has to do with the imagination of the city itself. If we continue to imagine the city as the city of wealth, as the engine of growth, then actually we are saying that the city will only cater to the wealthy. It will not cater to the poor. We have to think of conglomerations which cater to the poor. Then they cannot be engines of growth. They have to be engines that deliver basic services, work, livelihoods 
and a certain measure of happiness. If we can do that, then perhaps we've got something done as far as urban planning and a new paradigm of urban planning is concerned. That's my two bits worth. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you very much. Lots of lots of food for thought there and, and different perspectives. Um, and indeed, Dunu's remarks really lead us to the um, question which has got the next number of, of votes. Also, um, an anonymous question because you were talking, Dunu, about um, definitions of sustainability and what it is we want to sustain. And this question is, how does the panel ensure that communities understand the meaning of sustainable cities? I mean, perhaps they already do. Um, and obviously we are interested in engagement in this session, but uh, this is the question. Um, how do communities understand the meaning of sustainable cities and what it means for them so that they lead as catalysts of change? Priyanka, do you want to come in on that? And, and I mean, in your experience in, in Jharkhand, um, is there a kind of an understanding of what this concept might be, even if they don't, even if they don't call it sustainable city? I think for us in our context or with the community that we work with, sustainability very clearly means for them is, uh, you know, when the city will be able to provide them secure livelihood options, um, making, uh, when the city will be able to provide them uh, to at least have three pro proper meals a day, uh, a secure shelter, uh, a violence-free spaces, so I think sustainability, uh, the term in itself is very, uh, you know, uh, open to discussions and, uh, you know, um, open to discussions and critiques also. So I think uh, the place and the community that we work with has a very different notion of sustainable cities. Uh, it will not, it is not as per the, you know, the proper definition that is said, because uh, I don't think uh, that, you know, uh, one can think beyond, uh, you know, their daily, if then daily needs are not even fulfilled in the city that they live. Um, so I think broadly, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? Because it's not on the screen. Uh, no, the, the, screen's, the screen's gone. Um, okay. But from, from what I remember, it's uh, how, how does one ensure they understand the sustainable city so that they can become part of, um, of, of actually working for it, become catalysts. I think that was the word that was used. Okay, so I think uh, we do not, uh, you know, make them understand the definition of a sustainable city. Rather, we try to understand from them what is their perspective of a sustainable city, because I think in the long run, this is the thing that is going to help us to, you know, make the city more inclusive, which offers equal opportunities to its citizens. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's great. And um, I mean, I, I think all of us, I think, would resonate with that description of sustainable in terms of meeting basic human needs, which I think is how you, uh, you, you, you talked about it right at the beginning. Um, Emily, in Havana, do they have a sense of what sustainable city is all about? And, um, uh, and, and be, are, are they being active in creating it? Uh, I would say, I mean, the thing about in, in Cuba, they do have, they have a universal health and education and basic needs provision, and they kind of regard that as a right, and they take that as an assumption as a starting point that that's, way, that's what, of course, everybody has to have. Um, oh, wait a minute. Have I, is my video working? Is yes, it, working? it is now. It, it wasn't, but that's okay. all right. We were hearing you loud and clear. Okay. All right. Yeah. You can see me now, though, yeah? Yes, we yeah. can. Okay. So, so that's a kind of starting point, and I think that... Um, Clearly, you know, the, the, as we were talking about before, the aspiration to, to have a private car or to have an individualistic solution is obviously there. But I think um, what we've been doing is working through pilots. And I think the pilots are important, not just because of what they, um, the processes that people go through when they're participating in them at a local level, but also in the case of Cuba, that the, the, at the moment there's a process of, of municipalization, it's like decentralizing control of local economic development towards a municipality and towards a local area. And they're all in a process of learning. And so you do have various networks have been developed there at the moment for learning from each other's pilots. 
And so if we do something which seems to work in one area, then people in another area will get to see it. And so I think, you know, so what we've been doing is that we had an urban square, which was completely dominated by, by a taxi rank, which actually had taken over the whole area. And it was completely a very, very smelly place and nobody would spend any time there. And we reconfigured it, or we reconfigured it, that the project looked at how to reconfigure it with the local authorities. And in the end, they, they changed the way it was organized. And I've been back there since. And in the evenings, everybody's sitting out, children are playing and running around. And so people can see in a concrete way what a difference it makes if you think about what your vision is, what you're actually trying to achieve with that space. Um, so I'm quite optim optimistic that you know, these kind of examples can become rolled out. Another one that we're thinking of trying to work on is about urban trees. At the moment, they have um, a very unclear set of responsibilities. Who, who's responsible for urban trees? The only time they get looked after or treated is when a hurricane is coming and then everybody knocks off all the loose branches and, you know, in a very crude way. There isn't actually a system for doing it. But we know that trees are really important, especially in a hot city. Um, and so, you know, again, we'll be, we'll be looking towards pilots, looking towards working with schools. The universal health and education is very helpful there because not only do you have very good data, but you also have, you know, schools who can participate. If the municipality is working in that area, the school can work in that area, and we can do joined up um, so interventions. So, um, yeah, I think that clearly that it's an ongoing process to get people to think about what's sustainable. But I think if you're starting with, universal education, universal health, and a public awareness of the importance of the SDGs, then you're, you're in a good place to do things. Yeah, really interesting. So, so Dunu, what's your, um, you know, the people that you're working with, what's their conception of a sustainable city? Is it the same as Priyanka's or is it different? And um, yeah. Well, it depends on which kind of people, because see, the working poor, the city is not a homogeneous entity, according to me. It's a heterogeneous one, and there are class conflicts, caste conflicts, conflicts of gender, conflicts of ethnicity built into a city. So without understanding those conflicts, we can't spell out something for the entire city. But yes, this much I can say, that the working poor already have a sense of sustainability. See, the working poor, if you ask them, why do you work so hard? What is their answer? Their answer is because I want to see my children not having to work so hard. So the poor are not thinking about themselves and their present predicament. They're thinking two generations ahead. They're thinking of their children and their grandchildren and how those children and grandchildren can have a relatively easier time, unlike the kind of life that they have led. To my mind, that is the notion of sustainability. In 1957, that is many, many years ago, the working poor of this country negotiated a tripartite agreement for a living wage. That living wage consisted of food, for four units in the family, of 18 yards of cloth for each member of the family, for a house that was large enough for a family of five, and in addition, 20% for fuel, electricity, transportation, infrastructure, that is water. And then later, another 25% was added for things like social festivals like entertainment. So if I look at it, 60 years ago, in this country, the working poor already had an idea of what a sustainable future was like. This is what they wanted. Nowhere in that demand was there a demand for a car or for a mansion. They just wanted a decent life for themselves. They called it a living wage. Yeah. So that is what I take as a model and how to build upon that model to create a city. Yeah, really, really interesting. We've, we've, um, I was just going to draw attention to the Slido map on um, what people were thinking of in terms of sustainable cities. And uh, uh, as you say, uh, the motor car didn't appear on it at all from what I remember. Um, I did note, note that one person put in theater, which is fascinating that we really need theater in a sustainable city. 
And um, that, that I guess looking at the numbers, I guess that's only one person, but uh, certainly that resonates from London at the moment when all our theatres uh, are have been shut down and the people who work in them are in a, a pretty uh, pretty poor state. Okay, let's move on then to the next question. We've only got a few minutes left before the end of this session. So uh, panelists, if you could limit your response to this rather big question, I must say, just to about a minute and a half, and then we'll get through you all. And the question is, uh, do people have suggestions for transforming old cities with lots of cultural and geographical heritage and constraints? into modern sustainable cities all sorts of um, assumptions in that question about what a modern sustainable city might be uh, uh, and will it be a city with lots of cultural and geographical heritage and will that be experienced as a constraint or even as a benefit but there we go all the best questions are subject to multiple different interpretations. So let's start with um, let's start with you this time, Emily. Uh, and, and it may be that this question was was actually posed with Havana in mind. Well, it's an interesting one. Yeah, obviously the old cities have a great advantage of being designed for people on foot, um, and so they're much more closely tied. And they in Havana they got a problem with their new city that they built in the 1970s, which is you know, a long way away from the main city. It depends on um, uh, motorized transport and all the rest of it. So, you know, the idea that a modern city is more sustainable is a bit kind of um, questionable how modern. I mean, obviously what we've got now is we've got the opportunity of the new new technologies that there are. And certainly, you know, with electric vehicles, with some of the, and the communications technology, as was pointed out by Nikki before, is you can do an awful lot with that in order to improve equity and all the rest of it if it's carefully designed. Um, so I think that, you know, possibly um, there are a lot of things you can do with information. I think this whole question about planning for um, denser cities so that people have more um, uh, access is very important. But yeah, what is a modern, modern, this word modern, you know, I'm old enough to remember modern being used for some really um, very poorly thought out <laughs> interventions um, in urban planning. Uh, in the past. Um, but yeah, if we're thinking about the next stage of modern, we need to think intelligently. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Okay, thank you very much. Dunu, what about you? What's a, what's a modern city, a modern sustainable city in, in, in India? Well, let me put it this way. The old walled city, for instance, in Delhi, in the capital, uh, was planned, was actually planned for 100,000 people. Today, it holds 800,000 people, eight times, and it still functions. It's perfectly livable, it's walkable, there's a community life, there's culture, there's theatre, there's entertainment, they have this poetry uh, culture in the, in the walled city. So I would say that the walled city, I wouldn't want it to be modernized. I would like to remain where it is in the sense of community. But of course, it does require infrastructural improvements and they are possible to do provided we abandon the modern design. We okay, go back thank you. to designs which are natural. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Nikki, what about your last thoughts on modern sustainable city? Well, I, um, I, liked what, I, I liked what Emily said about how the old cities were, of course, for walking around. And I think, I, I think very interestingly now, there's a huge emphasis, and it's partly come from, from our experience, I think, of COVID. There's much more emphasis now on the neighbourhood and actually on us being able to, you know, Paris now has a concept called the 15-minute neighbourhood. We have a concept, the lifetime neighbourhood, which is that in fact, that most of your needs can be met within your neighbourhood. That's not to say that you might not want to, you know, travel for work, for, for work and culture and so on. But I think that that's got to be part of the modern city with very diverse and distinct neighbourhoods. And of course, I agree also with Emily about the sharing, um, well, the density, because density allows for much more sharing of resources it's much more equitable. It means you can actually have more vibrant, vibrancy and you can be more inclusive if you get it right. 
So I think that's very important. As far as the cultural heritage goes, which is absolutely crucial in London, um, and it can go all the way from a familiar landmark, which gives you a great sense of, you know, identity and belonging to, um, you know, to the big iconic things like Tower Bridge and so on. But it's apps, you know, and all our galleries and so on. And I think we have to realize that, you know, this is, this is our, un in a way in London, it's almost a unique selling point, but it's very, very important. I think our cultural yeah. heritage, our built our natural heritage, our cultural heritage for people's sense of identity and belonging. And um, it comes out over and over again in um, workshops with community groups. Okay, well, thank you very much. I've had a little message and Priyanka appears to have dropped off, which is unfortunate. There's probably an internet connection. Audrey, I'd like to just finish off by going back to you. You've been listening to all this and um, would you like just to round off the session? I'd just like to thank all of the panelists for, for their fantastic and very diverse contributions and for being very creative with the, with the briefs that we've set out to them. Uh, both in the overall presentation of the session and in response to uh, the audience questions as well. I thought that was, uh, that was tremendous. So I just want to say thank you. Indeed. And thanks from me to, uh, thanks to all the people who asked questions. Many thanks to our panelists who put in a lot of effort to, to prepare for this. And obviously we're all in very different parts of the world. So uh, we'll bring the, bring the session to a close now. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>